So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to enhancing the Fedora update process. process. Um, don't be alarmed. We're not pushing anything into Fedora. This is just a proposal. My name is Vincent Svenstra. I'm a senior software engineer and I'm working for Red Hat. <laughs> so we have a tool called Leap. Leap is not only a tool. It's also a framework uh, for application OS modernization. Um, as I said, it's a tool which will be used uh, for the upgrade from RHEL 7, 6 to RHEL 8. Um, it's the initial version. Anything else, uh, later, you know, you will see. <laughs> uh, what mo does modernization mean? Updating, upgrading the system, and then there's the question, isn't that that what DNF and uh, RPM is doing? Yes, and also no. Because Leap can allow you to do um, customizations and extensions of the upgrade process, uh, which is way beyond the capabilities of DNF or RPM, um, not only because of technical limitations, but also because of policies. Um, there are reasons for that um, to uh, guarantee the stable uh, upgrade transaction to happen. Um, so what we, with this tool, can actually do for the users? We can make optional things available to users uh, during the upgrade, things that haven't been there but are now optional in the, in the new version uh, can be made uh, available through um, giving them choice choices by asking them questions. Uh, what we can do is convert configuration file formats, sometimes from one version to another. Um, some parts of the configuration files changes, and um, the meaning changes, or the format changes, or values uh, get deprecated, uh, or things like this. So you can do this. With RPM, this is usually a no-no. Uh, we can allow third-party uh, applications to be upgraded together with the operating system. Um, that means like not only that, that you just include the repositories which you need, uh, which is uh, needed through the transaction, but quite often, like sometimes when you upgrade the software, then it needs database migrations to happen and things like this, so you never know. So this, these are basically uh, ways which can, you can use there. Um, as I already mentioned, you can ask the user questions during the process. Um, right now, there is no such thing in, in, in the RPM upgrade. Um, you can allow uh, to do things, yeah, that's what I already said. <laughs> um, yeah, you can actually influence the transaction. Sometimes you see that it does something, but you don't want it to be done. Um, for example, it installs something that you don't actually need because it sees it like, oh, this is a soft dependency or something, uh, let's install it with it, and, but you don't need it. Um, you can warn the user uh, about removed support for something that is in use or at least has been used in the past. It means you can scan the current system before you do the upgrade and see, oh, you're using ButterFS? Well, ButterFS will be removed, it's obsolete. There's always something better. Um, now, I have here a few scenarios which are hypothetical. They are not implemented, neither in RHEL nor anywhere else. These are just um, ideas in a, in a way uh, that you can imagine how we could improve the process. So like first, um, so asking the user to switch to the new, new bootloader specification. Um, in, uh, until now, we, every, every bootloader had its own configuration files, grub, zippl, or who knows what, which bootloader on what platform. And um, there was like a, a move to unify that in one place to have all the, the uh, bootloader specifications also across, as far as I understand it correctly, uh, also across the multiple distributions. So that there's like one way for doing it for everyone. A question to the user could look like this. Um, there's like convert to bootloader specification with a justification what it is it to give the user ch uh, a choice to do it or not and basically say yes or no and based on that the action will be taken or not. 
late, later on when it's time to do it. Um, another scenario would be detecting Python 2 application scripts and subscribe to the Python 2 channels. Well, I call the channels, but the actual name should be module streams as far as I know. Um, so you could ask the user, yeah, here I wrote it. Um, Python 2.7 module stream. We detected Python 2 scripts on your system. Uh, the new version of Fedora gives you the opportunity to switch to the Python 2.7 module stream. And then you can have a choice like to either just subscribe to the stream, uh, stream do nothing, or like abort the upgrade and do whatever or something with the system if you, if you want to. Um, another thing is like um, detecting these scripts or applications and warn the user about um, the discontinued support, which is a thing next year, right? I mean, Python 2.7 is no longer supported officially, at least upstream not. And um, it could look like this. And we could even show, for example, where we found these files. That said, these kind of scans would be very, very, very expensive on, on systems which have lots of files. Um, so these are just potential ex uh, things we could do. Um, other thing which happened, I think, when I'm not wrong, in Fedora 29, um, they switched to Postgres 10. But you can still have a Postgres 9 uh, per module stream, as far as I know. And um, sometimes you don't want to upgrade your database um, because like, you're not sure that the application that uses it, it will, will be actually happy about the fact that there's a newer version. Or vice versa. Maybe it's better to have a newer version and not to have, uh, not, you cannot support the older versions and whatever. So give the user a choice that they can switch to it. Or give them the choice to say, like, upgrade to the latest. <coughs> Another uh, thing would be like service defaults. Um, to, be quite, uh, to be quite honest, when I, I thought about that, uh, it seemed like a good idea, but I think it's maybe uh, not even that useful. But sometimes someone changes the user defaults, and we can detect that there are, not def that there are differences between that what will be and what should be. And uh, we can ask the user to convert them and merge or merge them and keep my changes and keep or keep the previous defaults or discard the changes and apply the new defaults and um, <clears throat> well again back to the third party applications um, part of this uh, extension could be just to update the repository also config uh, repository configuration um, sometimes these uh, they change locations they, they have different uh, ways of, of um, um, referring to the, 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 the path in the, in the URLs and so on, so which are not like covered by the uh, typical variables which, which are used in, in uh, Fedora or in, uh, in by YAM. So it can be used to, to update the repositories for the new, for the new systems that uh, the new RPMs will be found uh, during the upgrade. Um, yeah. And I have here an overview uh, over the upgrade workflow by example of RHEL, that means like how are we are doing it right now. Um, right now means like how we are going to do it basically for the, for the relate upgrade. Um, the first thing what the users would do, the yum install leap uh, as a tool and run leap upgrade. And there are like three stages. There's the, the original state where it's like in RHEL 7. We would just scan the system, we will download some things, but we will not modify really anything on the configuration or on the system. The next phase would be the init run disk that is like uh, a stage in between where we already boot into a new kernel, new system D, and uh, we'll be able to, with the new tooling of RPM to apply all the, the RPM transaction. And the last stage is basically starting uh, the relate system and uh, giving for some actions that need to be executed on the first boot, uh, give the opportunity to run them. So uh, in the first phase, um, we scan and collect facts about the system. That means like we scan like what is the networking configuration, what's the storage layout, and all these things we collect together. And uh, any tools that would want later to upgrade, like for example configurations or whatever, they would scan them collect the information, 
and would send them as messages to, to our, or store them uh, as messages in our system. Um, the next thing is like we would perform checks on this collected information to, to be able to, to block um, upgrades in case there is a problem. Um, problems could be that you use a kernel module that is not uh, supported anymore. Um, like I, I mean, like one thing I, I noticed it was like re uh, reversed later, but uh, I had the problem with the E1000 driver, which was removed during during the uh, development phase, and uh, basically this would be something we would detect and would prevent the user from from upgrading, so that they are not r ending up with an unbootable system or a s system that is at the end like uh, inaccessible because the networking driver can't be found. Um. Next section would be like that you ask the user about uh, questions um, about what you found, if you want to do something, you want to do something, um, like the scenarios you saw before. Um, the next thing is like we would solve the RPM transaction. That means like we're trying to solve the, um, the transaction from um, the RHEL 7 system to the RHEL 8 system and be sure that it works. And of course, download already all RPMs so they're, they're locally available uh, when we go into the init RAM disk. After we prepared the init RAM disk, which is like something um, that needs to be configured, of course, in the bootloader um, specific, uh, configuration, uh, we will start the init RAM disk, and from there we will not boot the system on the disk. We will just start in the init RAM disk, and we will switch into some different state where we actually continue with our process and we can apply first workarounds that will fix um, problems that are in the transaction, especially when you consider these big jumps that RHEL does, like from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8. There's like many years uh, of development for this, all these tooling and applications. Sometimes it happens that the RPMs are not able to upgrade without actually some intervention. We can do the workaround application before that and uh, perform then the RPM upgrade also, of course, there can be done some late checks before that. So in case um, sometimes you might be only able to detect some of the problems once you are already in the new system, in the, under the new kernel or in the new, uh, using the new uh, system D. Um, <clears throat> after, the, after the transaction passed, um, we would apply configuration fixes. This means like the new configuration files are updated based on the data that has been uh, found originally uh, in the RHEL 7 system. And uh, yeah, the relay checks should have been a bit, little bit earlier, but yeah. And uh, the last part is that we are scheduling the SA Linux relabeling. So because we changed a lot of things, and SA Linux during this transaction needs to be disabled because it would go crazy about what we're doing. Uh, we need to ensure that once it's rebooting, that it's uh, um, relabeling all the files correctly. So once we're booting into RHEL 8, the first thing that happens in the first time right now is that it will relabel everything because we told it to. Um, that is considered when you didn't disable uh, SA Linux, of course, uh, on your original system. And uh, we're getting then to the first, boost for first boot tasks. That means like sometimes we for example, can clean up uh, temporaries and things like this afterwards. Um, users could like, let's imagine like a, you have a, work, a workstation, you could get like what's new in RHEL 8 or something. This is like scheduled for the first time and not like uh, to come up every time. So, and then you're done, basically. So uh, I have a demo for this, which takes about four minutes. It goes just quickly through. There are no questions in this involved, but um, that's, I, I will like, give you just a little bit of a, an idea how this currently looks like. So uh, let's go to the start. So the first thing, I run the leave, <laughs> leave upgrade tool. It will, this is the, with the debug output. Yeah? So um, usually this, is, uh, this will be reduced <laughs> because it's too much information for, for someone to process and especially for normal users, this is not really uh, interesting. Um, the whole process uh, right now, what it does, it did already all the checks, 
it did already the scanning part. Right now, it's uh, preparing the uh, subscription manager to move to, to the relate subscription or to relate product, uh, but in a, in a um, temporary environment. That's, we basically use a, a systemd end spawn container with an overlay FS to, to modify the system without actually modifying the real system. And uh, so we are able to get uh, um, system, uh, the subscription manager to switch over to the new um, uh, product. And then after it's done, we are trying to get the, no, we're trying, we are getting the, the metadata from the repository. And we already, in this stage, we already applied through a plugin all the workarounds to, to make the transaction succeed and work exactly how it should be. Um, by default, YAM wouldn't be able to, uh, DNF wouldn't be able to resolve this. We're using already DNF here um, because uh, a lot of the packaging information is lost and there are packages replaced with other ones and they cannot be uh, uh, specified in the packaging. So this is like another reason why we had some, why we need some tooling like this. Now we will up, uh, reboot to the init RAM system. And uh, as you see, it's like already went through the first stage and now it applies already the, the upgrade transaction. Um, this is, if you look at the cursor, you will notice that this is sped up. Uh, <laughs> and also you can see it here. Uh, after about like 109 seconds of the boot, you will notice that it will be even faster because um, it took like 10 minutes to generate the RAM disks for whatever reason. Um, there are still things which we need to solve, but like this is um, still in, involved uh, in, in development. So that was finished. Relabeling is happening now, um, and uh, right after that, will be, it will be booting into the new system. Also, this was I think sped up twice or three, four times or something. It's just the whole process takes 17 minutes. I, I, I uh, narrowed it down to, uh, down to four, so that is not uh, taking too much time of the talk. <coughs> so, and now it's booting into Relight. And I, I just run some, some, a few commands that just like showing some things. Like in, you see already Linux, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8.0 beta and uh, it's like the Reddit release file and um, like network is up. And, just, and that's, that's it for the, for the demo. Um, but let's see how far we are with the time. Where are we good? So um, now I will give you an overview over Leap about the framework. What can it do? And what does, of what does it consist, what we're, what we're doing here? Um, the main thing is that we have a thing like called actors, which are the modules which actually do the work. And um, these actors, they communicate uh, over messages, uh, which we represent uh, in the form of models. The, the messages, uh, the models are basically the payload of the messages. Everything else is metadata around it that we know from where it came, when it was done, and, and things like this. But um, it boils down basically to data. A model, looks, a model definition looks like this. Um, be, uh, like experienced Python guys might have noticed that this is a very common uh, way of doing things like for databases, for example. Since we are talking here about data structures, it was like a natural choice to do something similar. And uh, we have a way of expressing things are optional by saying they're nullable or um, making them required by having them not nullable. And however, giving them a, the ability to spef specify a default value and that since they are like kind of optional as well. Um, there's like also the ability of inheritance. As you can see, you can um, use the same uh, model, but with different names uh, for different meanings. Sometimes you have the same data, but the meaning of the data is like something else. We have here the RPM, tra uh, RPM transaction tasks is uh, something for the workarounds, what I was talking about, where, where we uh, influence the, the RPM transaction. 
um, there's like, we say like, this needs to be installed, this needs to be kept, this needs to be removed, and there are like some local RPMs which we bundle to uh, solve some of the uh, problems with the packaging. And however, some of these actions actually need still to be filtered out. And that's why we need to, to separate it, because otherwise some actor says, I want to have the RPM transaction uh, tasks message, but I actually need the filtered one. So instead of like putting there a, f a field and saying like, hey, this is the filtered one, or this is not the filtered one, and having it iterate through all possible messages, uh, we would basically just duplicate it, uh, the, the structure and give it a new name. Um, we're using types basically for everything. Um, I will get there. Um, we have different field types. Um, if you look at it, there are no dictionaries. Um, we have strings, numbers, uh, also specifically integer offload, uh, booleans, date times, lists, and model. Well, model means like you can have another model uh, as a nested uh, item but you cannot have arbitrary key value pairs. If you want something like this, use a normal dictionary and dump it as a JSON string and you store it as a string. Um, it's too, uh, it, it, it basically prevents you from doing like uh, same checks about like uh, what's defined and what not because in the end you will end up with everyone just using dictionaries and um, this is not a good idea. We have also the dialogues here. Um, they look like this when you use them, just that here you just see right after the execution what was returned. So uh, I, I can show, if you want, I can show you that. I have it actually prepared. Um, go on. So, so is it readable? I guess it is. So you see, like, uh, it's waiting for input, uh, has a default value of the defconf CZ, which is like the current local uh, username for the, for the Wi-Fi, and you can specify uh, a password, which I just did, and it's like, uh, you see there was no echo, not echoing it, so it's really interactive uh, dialogues. Um, however, these dialogues are meant also to be replaced with, for example, cockpit. Uh, based uh, interfaces. So we could change the, the, um, the dialogues to be actually uh, web forms uh, in, if you would in start the upgrade through uh, some cockpit uh, instance. Um, that is still a hypothetical thing, but basically um, the way how we implemented it, it should be possible because we, we can just switch the renderer and it will handle all these things uh, for us. Um, <clears throat> I guess like a second question, like uh, what sci-fi universe you prefer? Um, I'd rather not answer this question uh, because there might people be very passionate about this. Um, probably even worse with uh, Marvel and DC. <coughs> so this is how this looks like. Um, really new, and not even my colleagues in the room will know that. Um, right now, this morning, I changed actually the way how we define um, dialogues. It will look like this, uh, something like this. Um, this is, again, a class, and it's, it's very similar to the models um, because it allows you to, to write it in a more natural way. Before, you had to create a dialogue instance and put there a tuple of components which you put there, and blah, blah, blah. it was just too complicated. Um, I got that as a feedback and I was like thinking about it, why not to do it like in, in, in this way. Then Pavel over there was like talking, why you don't use the models? And I was like, hmm. So I basically resemble the models in some way here as well. And use even the doc strings for the, uh, of the credentials, basically what is displayed to the user and just give the ability to set a title for the dialogue and you're done. Um, for the dialogues, you can ask the user like certain questions. Um, input types are text, numbers, passwords, which is like hidden input, of course. Yes, no answers, choice, and multiple choice. Multiple choices, 
everyone knows checkboxes, right? So, mm. um, workflows is basically the um, the thing how the framework knows what to do. This is like if you execute something with the framework, you specify a workflow. Uh, the beginning of our in-place upgrade workflow looks like this. I stripped it down from the documentation to get a bit more fitting in here, but the 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 gist is here. Um, you you specify basically uh, here this. You specify here just the, the the workflow class, and you define uh, subclasses in here, which are individual phases. And uh, so a workflow consists of phases, and in these phases are these. Okay. Missing a slide. <laughs> in these phases uh, will be actors. And the actors are selected by tags. And you see there's like, for example, checks phase tag, download phase tag, init RAM start phase tag, and ah, yeah, there we go. Uh, this, based on these tags, we can find, uh, we can find from, from all the actors that exist uh, where to put them into which phase and when to execute them. And that's like, you can see here, like these are like facts collection tag, uh, tag actors, these red ones, and uh, they will go into the facts collection phase. The yellow ones go, the checks phase goes into the checks phase, and so on. So, um, yeah. I think I will skip this today. This is not too interesting. Uh, we have a repository where all of these things are inside, and, um, these repositories can also be linked together. It means we can exist multiple repositories. Um, one use case where this would be, for example, that like a third party, uh, third party vendor would add their own actors and models and things like this into the, into the mix. And, but they also want to use things from the uh, existing uh, repositories uh, so they can actually link to it and include uh, their own actors into the workflow. We have also bundling support for tools, which uh, like bash scripts, even binaries, uh, files, like which you need data files for as templates or, or things like this, or input data. Um, you can have Python libraries uh, included, which is like your own things to, to, to make things better. And these things can be either private to the actor or shared across multiple. Um, this is just an overview, of, uh, overview about like what's all there. Um, I think that's not. Then we have a tool called Snacter. Snacter helps um, to develop the, the, um, the actors more rapidly um, because you need to follow some convention and Snacter can help you to uh, basically get rid of the boiler code and pre-generate uh, pre new things. Um, it can run the actors, so like for testing. Uh, it can run whole workflows also for testing. Uh, it can ge generate boiler, uh, boilerplate for actors, tags, topics, models, uh, workflows, uh, even create the repository. Uh, you can manage the repositories with it in a sense of you can uh, register them for local. Uh, yeah, there's a registry in your home uh, folder where it can store uh, the locations of all your repositories so that at any place where you are, they can list them and can find what is registered. And in the repository, it can show you what is in there and even what is linked to it. Um, and of course, it can do the linking of the repositories. Um, and now I come to the section, which is like usually the most uh, demanding one. <laughs> so, so for um, for the live actor demo, I prepared already a workflow and a uh, repository. Um, there's like, as I showed you before, there was like a work uh, for the in-place upgrade the workflow. This one has only two phases. It's the first phase and second phase. Uh, nothing special. It's just like I want to show you how you can get actually your things executed in there. So as a first thing, um, you see there's Nectar Discover, which gives you the overview and shows you what's in there. Um, I already predefined for, for here, uh, like two actors, a location provider that is supposed to be executed in the first phase, and the sync dev con conf data, 
uh, uh, actor that is supposed to be collecting all messages that are under the uh, DevConf data topic. Um, additionally, I, I have uh, the location model specified, a host name and a result host name uh, model specified. And for those, we will be writing now some, uh, some, some actors that actually use them, just that you get a feel of like how one would write like this module. So the first actor would be like, figure out what's the current host name. So um, it's obviously not a, big, not a big deal, but for that you can use this actor tool to provide, uh, provide you with the um, boilerplate. The thing what we need to do, we want to execute it in the first phase. So we copy that, put it here, um, and we want to have it included into the, in the DevCon workflow. So we need to put the, um, oh, sorry. Uh, we would put there also the tag for the workflow. And now since we want to produce, like uh, we want to scan for the host name and we want to produce a message that actually contains it, uh, we will already say produce uh, host name, which is the model, and we call this whole thing host name scanner. And we can now <laughs> let's lose. We just do the code, then I have it here. So, um, so you see, this is the boilerplate it generated for you already. It imported the models which you need. It imported the tags which you need, and it pre-filled it here. So the thing is, what you need to do is get going and the first thing we do we'll say um, we show a message that and to make it all work we need to have the socket library from python we produce a host name with the name variable um, the FQDN, and this is the first act that you wrote. That's all you need to do to get produce a message, send it to others for, for, for using it. To uh, see this in action, now we can use Nectar run to say on the hostname scanner. Oh, look. Okay. Something we did wrong. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> Live demos, yay. Um, what the hell? What if I'm wrong? 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 Okay, no, and. Okay, now I'm totally lost. Ah, okay. Now I see. Yeah. The file wasn't saved. <laughs> okay. So, um, you see it just shows, shows a message here. Um, but if you want to see what it produced, you can actually say print output. And you can see that it pr produced a message with the payload. Uh, which says like name field and it has the data for the local host, local domain, which is the host name of this virtual machine. And um, now if you want to process that message, we want to resolve the IP. For that we have the resolved host name um, model that inherits the host name model, so it gets also the name field and extended it with an IP field. So let's create uh, an actor that does this. So um, we can use the same the same face. Uh, we produce the resolved host name. We consume the host name of the other actor, and we call this actor host name resolver. So now it's here a new item, and you see it's like the host name resolver. So for every host name we get, so for host name in self consume host name, this will this will limit the input to just the type host name, 
Um, if you wouldn't do this and you would consume multiple types of messages, you would get everything. So basically, the specification of hostname here is a, is a filter on the type. Um, so now we want to wanna, uh, resolve it. So again, we use the socket and use self produce resolved hostname. Name is hostname name and IP is um, socket get host by name. Formatting. Um, so what we do here is like we resolve the host name in, in, in this uh, in here. Um, we pass through the name to the new um, to the new type, and we produce a new message and uh, send it further. So for every time we get, for it, there can be multiple messages of the host name. So there could be multiple actors that produce it, or there could be multiple host names that need to be resolved. This would take care of it. Uh, to be resolving all of the host names that are sent. Um, just for the sake of uh, the visibility, it was like self show. So resolving host names and Now, now I'm running this hostname resolver. But it doesn't do anything. Because we need to actually, if we use Nectar Run, we need to explicitly tell it to save something to be used by other actors. There's a reason for it. The reason for this is if you're debugging something, it would save all the messages. You would end up with a lot of bogus data in a, in, in, in a place that would later be used for another actor. So to avoid this, um, you, use, um, you call the first one again, but you say just uh, save output. And uh, now this one is doing something. So you saw before the workflow. You can execute it with Snector as well. And it will execute all the things. It was scanning for the host name. It was resolving the host names. It resolved it for local host, a local domain. And then at the end, I have a sync actor that actually consumes all the messages that have been produced. You saw there's like the defconf is that, which is like the first Acted as like providing location. The second message that was done was uh, the scanning for the host name, and the third one, which was done, was the resolved uh, resolved uh, IP. So basically, that's just a quick introduction to this. Um, writing actors can be a bit more challenging because there's a lot of things involved. But uh, I hope you, uh, that gave you a little bit of an idea. So, thank you. Any questions? Uh, one second. I just so if just like just quick links to documentation and uh, our GitHub organizations are here. So uh, please. I would rather see it as like working. Uh, oh yeah. The question was if. Uh, if it would be uh, replacing the system upgrade plugin. I rather would see it more as like either extending or integrating with it. Um, because that's basically what we do. We, use, we don't want to replace it. We just, for Fedora, it makes more sense to use the approach that it is used there. Yeah, so we would rather reuse what exists there and try to integrate with it. Yes, please. Yes, I did. Yeah, because it had some of these capabilities. 
Ja, maar dat is niet in bang. So the, yeah. Well, the question was if I looked at the history of FedUp, and yes, I did look at the history of FedUp, which is the Red Hat upgrade tool, actually. And um, yes, we have been looking into it, and there are known problems which we know about, like, uh, like for example, ABI problems and, and other things, but we are not doing the same mistakes which have been done there. Because, for example, one of the things which we are trying to avoid is like switching the system D context. Like we don't load like from our new system D in the init run disk, for example, the 20 versions older system D and trying to give it like the state from a new version. So now we are not doing this, and now we are not using Plymouth either. So, so there's uh, we're trying to avoid these things. Yes, please. Um, the question is if, if, there, if something goes wrong, if, if there's a way to roll back. At this moment, no. At this moment, no. But this definitely is something that we have to address. And uh, it's basically already a regression from the previous version of RHEL 6 to 7 because we actually support snapshots in some way there. Um, so we need to improve on that, but the initial version won't have it because of the complexity with, with the rest of it involved. Uh, it would be something which we add on top of it later, but no idea when. And do you have a way to, then just uh, do you have a way to verify if everything's okay after the upgrade, or is out go the question is if you have a way of verifying that everything is okay. Um, let's say it like this. Uh, if the you don't really have a way of verifying that everything is okay. You can do some checks, but even if, I mean, if you can't roll back, what are you doing? <laughs> yes? Um, like, let's say like it's the leap tool, we might bring it like the framework into it. Um, the upgrade tool does not make sense in, uh, because we don't have a workflow specifically, uh, specifically fitting to Fedora just yet. We don't have the time. This is more like a teaser of like, hey, get the Fedora community a bit like, or people who are interested with this, like get them interested into this topic to improve. Um, like we, we don't want to force them something, uh, to take something that they don't want. So it's, it's like basically, hey, look what we have. We offer you to, to, to use it as well. And uh, we are fine also with doing things for it and work with, with you, but um, we're not going to, to actively start with it right now because we are like not having enough time and for, for getting it done. We have not, uh, I don't know, a lot of other things to do. Um, I saw a question, yes. So, uh, uh, so you mentioned that one So the, basically, if, if uh, maintaining the uh, obsolete stacks in RPMs, uh, if that would have solved some of the problems we have, and if the Fedora community wouldn't like basically purge these obsoletes after like two or three versions um, to basically benefit RHEL well with it. Um, the thing is, like I thought so as well at the first moment, but actually the longer I think about it, it is quite a high burden to keep it in there. And also some of these things cannot be resolved with obsoletes or provides. Um, for example, the Python 2, Python 3 switch. Um, you cannot uh, say Python 2 version is obsoleted by a Python 3 version, even it's a library, because they c right now can even coexist. You know? So it is not so simple. You know? so that's why there are a lot of corner cases, and not all of the problems are like, related even to these things. We have a way around this for this. It's called Package Evolution Service, which provides us with data for this, but this is um, for some other time. Uh, any other questions? 
Yes. Yeah, so within a phase, like obviously there is the only, oh okay. uh, how does the uh, ordering of actors work uh, within a phase? Obviously the phases is not a problem, but the actors, they can send messages and they can write messages, and uh, can send messages and consume messages, and um, basically we need to be able to resolve the, the order. That's like what you were trying to say, right? So and what we are using there, what we're using there is topology sort, and uh, basically, any producer is executed first for anything that is consumed. So bef if in a, within the phase anyone produces something that the same phase consumes, that is done before. And no one can produce and consume the same message. So that's... Any other questions? No. Thank you very much.